Good evening and welcome back to our virtual Dominion Energy Jazz Cafe, returning with an evening of sonic exploration. We welcome back Victor Haskins and Skein.
Good evening, folks. Good evening. My name is Victor Haskins, and this is Victor Haskins and Skein. We have Mr. Randall Farr on the bass. We have Mr. Tony Martucci on the drum set. Uh, yeah, I just did the applause that you guys were doing. So we just played a tune of mine entitled Gray, and this tune appears on uh, actually my last two albums, um, and it, this is a composition that I wrote based on a sh short story that I created, um, which is following the story of our hero named Gray, and they're in this po post-apocalyptic world, and so we're kind of cre creating this musical environment, um, an actualization of, of that kind of scenario. So that was Gray. And this next tune we're going to perform for you is uh, from a newer set of music. Uh, this tune is called That Which Is For Me, um, and that's part of a longer phrase, uh, which is that which is for me cannot resist me, which is that the things that are meant for me in my life's path or the things that I will notice and that will, I will have access to. Um, and so um, capitalizing on those things, this is that which is for me.
That was that which is for me. This next tune we're going to play for you is uh, another throwback tune for us. This tune is called Psidurism. Psidurism is uh, an archaic term referring to the sound that wind makes when it rustles the leaves of trees. Psidurism, that's P-S-I-T-H-U-R-I-S-M.
that was Sidhirism. We're going to play our last tune of this set here. This last tune is called Alone With My Thoughts.
Victor, an exploration of a sonic impulse, indeed. Would you take a moment just to tell us something about the journey we're on tonight? Over here. Victor Haskins, welcome back to the series. Thanks for having me back. It's been a pleasure hearing this first set of music um, and getting to learn more about what you do and how you play. We'll skip the first two questions because we've asked them before. Uh, so let's jump right into this instrument you play. I don't think we had a chance to get a good, deep look at it last time. What can you tell us about it for those who've never seen one before? So this is, uh, you can call it an EWI. Um, that's an acronym, EWI, which stands for Electronic Wind Instrument. And so it is a wind synthesizer, much like you might have a keyboard synthesizer. Mm. Um, and you could, there's onboard sounds on it, but I don't use the onboard sounds. I design my own sounds in a computer and then use uh, this MIDI transmitter to, to transmit the data and use this as a MIDI controller. And so basically this instrument can sound like anything, anything that you could sample or design in a synthesizer or a computer program, then you could make this instrument play it. Um, sometimes I use it to play um, bass, because I have a couple of nice bass samples, um, and of course I use it very heavily in uh, this project, Skane, as well as my solo project, I Improv a Story, in order to play percussion and, and harmony and noises and different things. So it's a very versatile, useful uh, musical instrument tool. So what is the benefit to designing your own sounds rather than using the sounds that come pre-programmed? Um, well, the sounds that come pre-programmed um, allows it to be plugged directly into a speaker. So if you just bought the instrument, then you can immediately get you know going with it because um, it has onboard sounds. Uh, but being able to design my own sounds allows me to create more a more unique fingerprint for what I do. I mean, just like on your horn or an acoustic instrument like the, the cornet or, you know, the clarinet or the saxophone, whatever it is, you get your signature by practicing long tones and working on your, your sound. Your sound is your, your identity. And so similarly on electronic instruments, because there isn't necessarily that same kind of like physical, the physical effort that you have to create in order to like work on your embouchure in order to make a nice sound on the trumpet or the cornet, it's very different because there's not as much physical strength required to play this, right? This mouthpiece isn't like a reed. It's, a, it's like a synthetic thing that allows me to send byte data in order to make vibrato happen. So it's not like I'm you know, having to build up a whole bunch of strength in order to operate the instrument. And so the, individual, the individualism comes from being able to design sounds that have particular sonic qualities when I change the parameters of the input so depending on how hard I blow or like if I blow maybe this hard then I get this sound and then after this threshold then it has different qualities to the sound and so that makes a lot of personalization possible which allows me to write music that I uh, have more control over to, to make it sound more like what my world sounds like. Now it does require strength of the amateur to play the cornet. Sure. So switching back and forth between having to use as much muscle to play a horn and what you're describing is not needing to use that much muscle for the iwi. Is, is that a, does that feel kind of confusing in the mouth, or is it sort of a break and give you a chance to, to recover? Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of both and, because even though you don't require maybe the same level of strength to play the iwi that I do to play the cornet, um, it is taxing on these muscles uh, because I do have to secure my lips around the... Right. Um, blow sensor in order for it to have the air like not escaping from my lips but it's a different way of blowing because you don't want to blow into it the same way you blow into a cornet because it'll create condensation inside the instrument I've definitely destroyed at least mm. one of these with condensation in the instrument from like blowing too hard into it from like because you know when you're playing or when I'm playing at least then like you know you're getting into it sometimes and you're really like emoting or like you're, you're, you're in the the groove or whatever and like you want this certain level of intensity and it you have to play the cornet a certain way to get that whereas you're going to overblow the instrument and not get the effect you want on this. You almost have to like back off, even though mm -hmm. you're used to like having like push really hard. Um, you know, like maybe for like weightlifting or something like that, it's like the difference between like maybe lifting a 300 pound like bench press like that. You have to put a lot of force into that versus like this. You don't want to do that because you're mm -hmm. you're not going to get the same thing out of it. It's a matter of designing the sound so that you can intuitively perform in such a way that you operate the instrument with tact. <laughs> it's a lot to think to think about. It is. Yeah, it is. Sure. Def but I mean, I've gotten used to it at this point, yeah. but it definitely was a challenge in the early days of doing it, for sure. Okay, so back us up in time a little bit, if you can. When do we start seeing this instrument? I mean, when does it appear, and how is it used? How is it used now? 
Oh, I'm not so completely sure about the history of, of uh, electronic wind instruments themselves. I want to say they started to come up around maybe the 70s. Okay. Um, I want to say Niall Steiner is like the originator of um, the electronic valve instrument. So that if you see this, this is kind of like looks, people ask me, oh, is this an electronic clarinet? Because it's kind of geared towards woodwind mm -hmm. players and it has various woodwind instrument fingerings programmed into it. So if you play saxophone or oboe or flute, then you can already just like transfer some of those fingerings to this. Now there is also a fingering style called EVI fingerings, electronic valve instrument fingerings. Um, and if you see an electronic valve instrument, it looks like the colloquial name for it is a bug sprayer because it looks like a, a bug sprayer where like you rotate this, uh, um, this pot that allows the octaves to change right as you're playing it, but it's geared more towards like trumpet players if you're like doing this and you change this for the octaves. Whereas this, I'm using my thumbs to change octaves, um, and like it, it does look like electronic an electronic clarinet. Um, but I just happened to to use this myself because um, I just done some research and listening to some different um, people playing it back in maybe in college, uh, but also. Afterwards, I was just, as I was thinking about how can I expand the sonic palette of what I have available, because um, something I noticed when I go to when I go to different performances, I was like, it doesn't matter how good someone is who's playing, I want to hear a certain amount of variety. And after like hearing a certain number of tunes in any set, my, my own set or other people's sets, it's like hearing the same sonic timbres yeah. gets boring. And so it's like, how do I get more variety without necessarily having to be more virtuosic or without having to put a certain level of energy into it like because like there's these different ways to create variety whether we're talking about like you know what is the color or like what is the intensity mm -hmm. or like what is the speed there's so many different ways to do that so I'm always trying to think about how can I create a very special variety of these different elements in order to create a, a unique moment a, a especially unique moment and so being able to design sounds and have control of that um, gives me that ability to create the kind of uniqueness and the specialness of a moment uh, that I'm seeking to do when I perform. I don't mean, I didn't mean to ask so many questions about the intro, but I'm fascinated no, by go it. For it. Go for it. You, you spoke a little while ago about condensation having destroyed an instrument in the past, perhaps. Uh, what kind of upkeep does it take to keep this instrument um, balanced, of, of healthy? You don't have a reed to think about. I, I don't imagine you need to do much tuning. No, no, no. I mean, it's a. Uh, um Actually, there's been a few times where the fact that this is an electronic instrument has like kind of saved me. I know I had to do a couple of performances out outside when it was like winter time, and you know, cold affects instruments mm -hmm. to make them really flat. And sometimes they're so flat you actually can't put them in tune. Um, and so, you know, I was able to use this instead of the the Cornex I had both at that time. But there's not really much upkeep. I mean, the main thing is that you don't want to blow directly into the instrument. Uh, very hard the same way you'd blow into a, a trumpet or a saxophone because that will create water and water and electronics don't mix but outside mm -hmm. of that there's nothing, nothing to really do maybe wipe it off when you're done but outside of that it shouldn't be a it's pretty easy to upkeep. Sometimes when when educators get a student and they're trying to pick an instrument sometimes they'll encourage them to play something like the trombone or the French horn because few people play them and it will make them more um, hireable or easy to get a scholarship sometimes you say. Do you find a similar situation with this instrument or is it so obscure that it becomes more difficult to find work? Oh, well, I mean, it's pretty obscure. I wouldn't recommend anyone start off <laughs> playing an EW. You, sh you should definitely play an acoustic instrument. I mean, there's qualities of humanness that you have to develop through the struggles of developing yourself on an acoustic yeah. instrument and True. that directly translates to how you would play uh, an electronic wind instrument or any kind of synthesizers, that human element, so you're not, as I said, that you're not being played by the instrument. You don't want the mm -hmm. instrument to tell you what to play. You want to tell the instrument what you want it to do. And that's, uh, I think that's the mark of, of true artistry to say like, oh, I have this thing in my imagination and I'm gonna use my tools to make that thing happen. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, this is definitely like a secondary type of, of instrument to, to be able to learn. I think, yeah, primarily you, you should, someone who's young should work uh, on an acoustic instrument because that's going to give you opportunities to actually play with other other folks and to I don't know yeah it's just like I feel like there's there's just things that you will learn from that experience that you won't ever learn from this but this is a very very useful secondary sort of thing to explore I think I'd agree with that you got to develop that embouchure I mean at this point I couldn't play a horn my, my mouth's too weak in your composition and in your playing style tonight there are very many dynamic things that you're doing 
One such thing is the use of crescendo and decrescendo. How do you accomplish that with this instrument? Is, is it more breath or is there a, a button you press? Well, it is, so the way, uh, and this comes back to like how I designed the sound, so on my pedal board, if you, you'll see in the next set some camera so shots where they show, you know, me using the pedal board. I don't use it as much with some of the sounds I was using today, but um, the amplitude, the volume that you get on this instrument, just like on an acoustic instrument, is directly correlated to how hard you blow into the instrument. So more air, if you think of like a, a slope, you know, going a positive slope, then like if Y equals X and like X equals the amount of air input, then Y equals the amplitude and, and the volume, right? But also with amplitude, you get timbral change. So when I play, you know, the cornet at like a soft volume, ooh, versus loud, like ah, you know, that's a very different, sound quality, it doesn't just go ooh and then ooh at 10, you know what I'm right. saying? Like it changes the color and that's part of you know what's valuable about that instrument, it has that character where it like opens up and changes to a brassier sound the harder you blow into it. Um, similarly, the kind of sounds you might develop on this depending on what kind of timbre you want at a very uh, different amplitudes, you know, so I might want this, if say we have this like um, spectrum here, and maybe I want this color on the spectrum, but I want to do it at this amplitude, at almost nothing. Or maybe I want this color here on the spectrum, but at this amplitude. Mm -hmm. So I use a volume pedal to kind of attenuate that when I'm trying to make different colors at different volumes. And that's something I had to learn just by doing performances, because I'd be playing, I'm like, oh, I like this like sound. I know what this sound is gonna do when I really put some air into it and like make it louder. But then it's like, oh, I don't want it to be loud at this point, because I want it to blend with what's happening, you know, texturally with other instruments that are happening. And so in order to do that, I need to like attenuate the volume so I can get the color over here, but at this volume here, because I'm always thinking about like blend and like what's happening mm -hmm. in the moment and, and how can I enhance that. And in order to enhance something, you have to like know what the thing is and have several different ways of perceiving the thing so that way you can m make what you might deem the best choice. I'm thinking more, beginning to think more about the music. <clears throat> how, what are you thinking about when you're writing? Uh, particularly for this instrument, is it the does this idea of the sound you'd like to use come first, or the idea of the structure of the music come first? What, how do you how do you get this going? The structure of the music is always first. I feel like any time writing a tune, it's coming from one of two places. Either I'm trying. Well, most of actually most of the music I'd say I've written is coming from some kind of particularly interesting thing melodically that mm -hmm. I'm imagining, or maybe there's a particular feature of a tune that makes me feel a certain way, like in the tune we just played alone with my thoughts, right? And then the idea behind that tune is like, um, it's evoking the feeling of what it feels like for me to kind of be in my, my prime work time, which is like two or 3 a.m. when like the world feels like it's quiet, you know? So I'm alone with my thoughts, which is a very good place to be. So it's like, there's these pauses, deliberate pauses in the music where like we're all kind of hitting and then it's like a sisera, but like the, the sound patch I've chosen kind of like developed over the time, it has this very kind of ethereal quality and it's got like a lot of delay to it and a lot of reverb to it and that's kind of like gives you this kind of dreamy sort of feeling there. So like that particular section, that 16 bar section in the middle with all those ba ba right, that's like super mm -hmm. important for like how it feels, where it feels like time is like stopped. Mm. And so mm. that's kind of the idea of how I approach all the tunes is there's different features that like make me feel like different Mm, other things that are happening, they're correlating to non-musical events. And so I'm using music and sound and rhythm um, and the way that we're going to be able to play together in order to create these environments. And so I want every tune to feel like its own world. So I don't want to just feel like, I'm, I don't know, I'm just running a bunch of chord changes or something like right. that, like every right. kind of right. thing that I'm playing. I, now obviously there's like things and like maybe conventions of language of, of, of playing harmony or, or invoking harmony um, that of course I use and that are just like how I speak the musical language, the language of music, of, of creating and curating sound. But mm -hmm. each mm -hmm. particular tune is tr designed in such a way where there's a certain amount of freedom for us to be able to really go anywhere, but at the same time there's like really specific elements that allow um, the tune to have its own fingerprints, its own identity, its own personality. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the, I feel like the hallmark of, of my writing is being able to like every single tune, like, oh, this is so specific, I can't really replace a tune with another tune, where it's like, oh, this tune's sort of like this other tune. It's like, every tune is really specific with like what it feels like. And so 
it's, I don't know, I'm just always trying to create like a, a body of work that feels very diverse. So when I'm playing a show, it, it feels like we're going a lot of different places because um, I, I just love variety. Beyond the fingering, beyond the different use of the embouchure, if you can, would you compare and contrast your use with this instrument and the cornet? Ooh, now wait, wait, what am I comparing? Like, How do you, what, in your writing style, in your phrasing, mm -hmm. what is different between the way you use this instrument and the way you use I the cornet? I you. Well, um, I feel like, I feel like there's certain tunes that are geared towards the fact that this instrument isn't particularly like physically taxing on one hand, but also there's like a certain kind of drive that I can create with this instrument that I wouldn't want to create with the cornet. Like it feels like it's doing too much. And just be, the way that I sound on the instrument and the way the instrument makes me feel when I approach the cornet, um, it suggests that it should be played on certain tunes in certain situations that will allow for certain kinds of spaces or certain kinds of interactions, certain kinds of expressive qualities that only that particular acoustic instrument has. Uh, and, and you know, it, it is very specific that I'm playing the cornet versus the trumpet because uh, trumpets in general make me hear different ideas mm -hmm. that I don't find them to be as interesting to approach as the cornet and like the way it allows me to hear ideas and imagine situations. And so this instrument, because there's so many different things I can do with the design and the sound, then there's particular qualities that allow it, uh, particular situations which make it, you know, the superior choice um, I could do really any of these tunes on both instruments, but I've definitely discovered certain tunes, it's like, oh, I could go cornet or EW on this one, and certain tunes, it's like, oh, this is an EW tune, or this is a cornet tune. And there's been times where I've, you know, as I'm exploring, I'm like, I played a tune on EW, and I'm like, oh, this tune doesn't, I really don't get to the heart of what that mm. story was about. I used the wrong tools, like trying to use like a, a hammer to like chop salmon or something like that you know it's just like this is the wrong tool and, and and vice versa i've definitely been like man i really should have picked the iwi on this so i'm like playing the cornet and now i'm like working extra hard and not getting the effect that i want yeah. and so you know it's just all like an experiment it's a uh, it's always in flux i mean even like you know i feel like every performance my goal is to make it the most interesting and the best performance yet i mean best of course not necessarily mean i don't make any mistakes or whatever but it just means that i feel like i was able to reach beyond where i was and take risks in a different way. And once again, like what makes something a risk? What makes something interesting? And it's all contextual. Like what I might think is interesting today for today's performance, I maybe didn't think was interesting two days ago and might not think is interesting when I hear it on Thursday when it comes out. So it's just kind of like, I'm always just trying to be as in the moment and open to what you know the universe is like suggesting that I should do at that moment. Uh, and the only way to Im improve and increase your ability to perceive things is to practice because practicing allows you to observe a lot of different possibilities of how to create and curate sound. And when you come into a situation where you're now playing with other people and they're making decisions, you're trying to make decisions in relation to their decisions, having that ability to say like, oh, I've, I've seen this particular situation before, I've had time to play with it and see it from like eight different perspectives, and so now I can decide of these eight paths, which one do I want to take at this moment? But the thing is, you're always making those decisions every single like millisecond of the tune, like going through door number one, well now doors number two through eight are, are not there, but now there's a whole new set of like doors that you have to like choose, every note, every moment, you have to make and decide about these decisions. I mean, and even life is like this, and so it's just like, it feels like the more deeply I get into discovering how I deal with harmony or how I view situations, then the more, um, the stronger my ability to make decisions in other areas of life becomes, because I feel like there's like a parallel understanding and, and growth of perception and comfort with the choices that I'm making because I trust that that choice will lead to something else versus feeling the need to control. Like making a choice isn't necessarily about control, it's mostly about being and, and like showing up for that moment. And mm -hmm. so like being in control isn't like the goal. The goal is to show up as much as possible for every moment possible. Deep. Uh, I've kept you for longer than I said I would, but I've got one more question. Go maybe, the, maybe the simplest of them. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, many instruments can create harmony. Most 
instruments we blow into cannot. Mm -hmm. With this instrument, is it as simple as pressing more than one uh, key, maybe, at the same time, or is there some other step involved? Um, well, there is like a, a button on here that allows you to do polyphony, um, and so uh, I guess what for me what I what I call it is is threading what it, when I do it because it feels like like when I press these buttons it like enables each note will get like sticky and so every successive note will be held down. So if I say it, I play like C E G B, but if I hold down that button first and click that button and enable it then when I play the C and I play the E and I keep blowing, I don't articulate between the notes, then the C will stay held and the E will be added to it and every other successive note until I re-articulate and break the chain. And so I have to be very particular about what notes I choose because it's sort of like you're playing a piano that you can't play all the notes yeah. at one time, but you can play them very quickly in succession. So like you have to really be precise with what notes you're choosing because you don't want to include chromaticism in the, in the wrong place because then it'll rub with the other note and that might not be what you're trying to do harmonically. So it's just like, uh, it's just a diff different kind of knowledge to use in order to create a different kind of effect, a different kind of texture right. using what you already have. Just like using a sustain pedal. Sort of, yeah, exactly. Love that. Boy, I love talking to musicians, especially smart ones like you. Victor, Appreciate thank that. you for the conversation and for the music and for the education for our ears. We're for in sure. for some more of it in the second half. Are you ready to give it to us? Let's do it. All right, thank you, sir. This next tune we're going to perform is another original tune called Discernment.
That was discernment. We're going to play another original for you called To Seek Understanding.
That was to seek understanding. And the meaning behind that tune is that uh, anytime I've been in some kind of conflict, uh, I've always learned and gained more by trying to seek to understand the other side, even when I'm right. Um, because this helps me learn about different perspectives and relate to people uh, in a more loving way. So, to seek understanding. The next tune we're going to play is called A New Way. And the concept behind A New Way is that... Um, you know, your personality is, is your superpower. That's what makes you unique and different from everyone else. And so instead of trying to change yourself, maybe you have some kind of unhealthy habit or a thing that it doesn't serve you, some kind of behavior that doesn't serve you. Instead of trying to change it, you should instead find a new way of being yourself instead of trying to change who you are because you can't change who you are and you wouldn't want to do that anyway. But you should find a new way to be who you are to be the best version of yourself. So this is a new way.
All right, so our last tune is coming up here. Thanks y'all for joining us for this very special program of music. It's always a joy for us to play for you and to play this music together. Um, this last tune we're going to play for you is uh, another original composition called Me Versus Me. And the idea behind this tune is that um, even when you are in a situation where you might be competing with someone in maybe like a race or something like that, you're never really competing against other people. It's always you versus a previous version of yourself. Uh, I think that's the healthiest way to use competition to level to raise your, your level um, is to try to be better than you were yesterday. And if you do that, then you're on the right track. So this is me versus me.
Wow, indeed. That has been a, been a ride of days long by and things yet to come. <laughs> what an adventure that was. Thank you, Victor Haskins. Skein, welcome back, fellas. Thank you for that music. Thank you, Richmond Jazz Society, for bringing us music like this week after week. Thank you to Dominion Energy for helping us to pay for programs like this and other events around the museum. Remember Tommy Productions back on the stage with their cameras and tonight Michael Hirsch at the boards in the booth. Thank to you to those of you at home for loving with us. Thank you for listening to us and thank you for learning from us. Again in Richmond, Virginia at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts from the Leslie Cheek Theater stage, this has been our virtual Dominion Energy Jazz Cafe. I'm Robert Fennard. Good night. <laughs>